Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Warren County Historical Society's Harbin Museum Lunch and Learn for uh, January 2023. I'm John Zimkus, the Education Director and Historian here, and I am your host, and we're glad to have you with us today, beginning the new year with another group of what you will hopefully find as fascinating talks for our Lunch and Learn series. Uh, some things going on uh, uh, while you're here, some things you might want to check out. We just set up in the Semendinger Gallery uh, on the main floor of the Harmon Museum behind me. Baby, it's cold outside. Uh, we have one of the finest textile uh, departments uh, you will find in any museum in this part of the country. And we have on display dozens of coats going back 120, 130 years through the 20s, through the 30s, through the 40s, into the 50s and 60s. Um, fascinating. Now, um, many of them, of course, are fur-oriented, as was the fashion. So um, if you're anti-fur, please don't hold it against us. We're putting it we're putting it up there because of its artistic and historical significance. Uh, but that, I think you'll thoroughly enjoy that. Um, we also have art classes beginning. Our executive director, Dr. Mark McCoyan, will start giving classes on, Jan on January 31st, and they will be through March 7th. Um, Basically, different styles of art, art through history, and other such things of that nature. Our museum, Music at the Museum program is going to begin on February 9th. Tibetan Bowls with Ron Esposito, Esposito uh, 7 o'clock on February 9th. Should be fascinating. I will have the uh, honor of being your speaker uh, for the uh, February Lunch and Learn, which will be on the 15th. Abraham Lincoln's many Warren County connections. Some of those connections are uh, family oriented. Some of those connect connections are supporters, nemesis, um, allies, uh, and a few other things. And we'll have some artifacts which connections. I think you'll be surprised at many of the connections for that. Um, March 9th, we'll have another music at the museum. Uh, Bobby Strohar, a Celtic harpist, will be here. Um, on March 22nd, we have a very special Lunch and Learn. It's a move to a different date. It'll be still on a Wednesday, but it'll be the March 22, the fourth Wednesday rather than the third, because we're able to have two authors on Shaker history who will both be talking about their brand new books. Um, Christian Goodwillie from Hampton University in New York State will be talking about Richard McNamara, frontier heretic and Shaker apostle. McNamara was, without a doubt, the prominent homegrown Shaker in Union Village, four miles west of here. He was not one of the, uh, the ones who came out uh, west from New York, but he became one of the leading defenders, reading writers, leading composers, um, and it's all his life. And we'll also have the debate, is his last name McNamara or McNemer? Um, most of us here in uh, Southwest Ohio call him McNamara, although Christian will probably call him McNemer. Also that day will be Carol Mellicott from New York, uh, Northern Kentucky University, uh, who all, we already have a book of hers in our, on our, in our shop, um, is Akir Bates, A Shaker Journey, one of the three missionaries who came over in 1805. And, but her new book is Shakers of the Kentucky Bluegrass. Uh, Kentucky did have two uh, settlements, of course, Pleasant Hill, which you may know uh, still open as a historic uh, site, and also uh, South Union near the Tennessee border. Um, and so the two of them will be here. That same evening, the 22nd, they will have a special evening thing. If you can't make it to the Lunch and Learn, but still want to hear them, there will be a special uh, evening lecture about how they did their research and that sort of thing. 
On April 19th, we're gonna have Jack Blosser, the former director of uh, Ford Ancient here, and he'll talk about prehistory versus history, how the area changed once we started recording the history and knowing, learning about the history of the area, uh, Native American and uh, Euro-Americans. Our director, Michael Coyne, will do a, our lecture on May 17th, what's new at the museum? Uh, things which are, uh, we're be, be giving things constantly, brand new things. There are several brand new items uh, in the uh, folk art gallery, which you, you should take a look at in the, on the main floor of the Harmon. But he'll talk about many of the new things we have here. Uh, Suzanne Alice Anderson Taylor, uh, you may remember her from uh, earlier last year, uh, where she talked about letters from Paris, her grandmother's pen pal in Paris, and how um, uh, they, he was writing about the coming war and why doesn't America get more involved now and that sort of thing. Uh, she is a teacher at, at Lebanon High School, and one of her loves to teach is about British coronations. And so that'll be right after uh, Prince Charles is crowned king, and she will talk about all the symbolism and all the activity and all the things that have taken place in that. So there's quite a few things g going on. And um, so I hope you will join us for many of the other things. One thing I do want to tell you, um, we do have a new caterer now, and uh, it is Watkins Catery, uh, outside, uh, out of Lebanon. Uh, your meal today is somewhat based on the, the topic. You do have um, succotash, uh, mashed potatoes, beef, and a Johnny cake made out of cornmeal. So sort of a uh, Civil War error. Now, I didn't say hardtack now, so you won't have to break it on the floor, get a hammer, but uh, Johnny cake. So uh, now because also, as you can tell, a part of the catering uh, service is that they are serving it, they need to know by the Wednesday before the lecture, how many people are coming. So if you are going to come to Lunch and Learns in the future, please make your reservation at least one week before, the Wednesday before, so we will have an exact count so we can tell them and they can hire the personnel needed to help serve you here. So a lot of interesting things going on. Don't forget there's a discount at our gift shop for all of you here, 10% off because you are with us. And visit the museum, see the uh, Baby It's Cold Out display and a lot of other neat things going on. So enjoy your Johnny Cake and beef and mashed potatoes and succotash, and I'll introduce the speaker in about 20 minutes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to the Harmon Museum's Lunch and Learn for January uh, 2023. Um, we have uh, another speaker out of the Love and History uh, living History Presentations. Uh, they are uh, organized by Joyce Lovins Browning. Uh, Joyce is not here right now, at least I can't see her. Uh, but she has been capable uh, and helpful in bringing to us in the past Annie Oakley, Mary Cunningham, an 1870 grave robber from Cincinnati, Martha Washington, the first First Lady, Mary Draper Ingalls, who survived being captured by the Native Americans in the 1750s and taken from Virginia home into Ohio and then escaping uh, recently for our Frontier Fair. And I hope to have her uh, here the next fall. Mary Burnett Craig Carpenter Dunleavy, um, the wife of Francis Dunleavy, the first teacher in all of this area, who is credited with being Ohio's first Revolutionary War nurse, and therefore a Revolutionary War veteran. Uh, but today, uh, Joyce has helped organize the fact that we have Lottie Moon. Now, I went to Miami University over in Oxford many, many years ago, and uh, 
There, one of the houses I've often passed was Lottie Moon's house on High Street. She uh, lived, uh, her house was not too far from the president's mansion of the university. But all I ever knew about her is that they said she was a Confederate spy. <laughs> and now we're gonna get some of the details. Um, the life of Lottie Moon Clark, newspaper reporter, author, and spy. <laughs> Well, thank you, John, for that wonderful introduction. And like he said, my name is Lottie Moon, but Lottie Moon Clark is my name. And it's always nice to be back in the state that I was raised in, which is Ohio. I have traveled around the world in my life, but it's always nice to come back to familiar places. Now, <clears throat> I, was, I was born in Virginia and my parents moved out west to Tennessee and then again to Ohio when I was about five years old. So being considered um, an author and a newspaper reporter, I also had the title of Confederate spy. And since that is the question that I get asked most often lately is how? that I become a spy. I think we'll just reminisce today and I'll tell you a little bit more about myself so you will understand as well. Like I said, I was born in Virginia. My father was a doctor. He had inherited a plantation, slaves. Our family were slave owners. And we had quite a large family. He had quite a few brothers. But father believed that slavery was an abomination. He did not like that. And so he sold the plantation and freed all his slaves. And he and some other family members, we moved to Memphis, Tennessee first. But daddy was an educated man. He truly valued education. And he had heard about the small town in Ohio where there was a college and that it was growing up to be a very educational town. So we moved north to Ohio, in Oxford, and that is where I grew up. I spent my entire childhood and early adulthood in Oxford, and I was educated. Dad made sure that all of us were. And I attended a lot of parties. I enjoyed horseback riding, and I was a pretty good shot, too. I could handle myself with a gun. And I enjoyed the theater. I loved plays. I loved acting in plays. That was one of my talents, I guess you could say. Well, being in Oxford, there was a lot of young men attending college up there. I had quite a few gentlemen callers. And one of those gentlemen I had met at a mutual home of a friend, and he was a military man. He happened to be in on leave. And we met there, and he told me he fell madly in love with me. He wanted me to set a good date, is what he said. He constantly called on me. In fact, he would bring a bag full of candy for my youngest sister, Virginia. Jenny was only five years old when he would come call at the house. And she loved to count the buttons on his uniform. So instead of calling him by his name of Ambrose, she called him Buttons. But the gentleman I'm referring to was Ambrose Burnside. He was a tall, stocky young man who had a mustache that grew straight up into his hair. We set the date, and the wedding was gonna be at our home in Oxford. And before you knew it, the invitations went out, and we were standing in front of the minister, and I just couldn't do it. Ambrose said his vows first, 
pain vowed to love, honor, and obey me for the rest of our lives. But when I looked into his eyes, I was like, no siree, Bob. I handed him my bouquet and I ran out of the room. Well, I know I broke his heart. And I did continue our communications when he went back to uh, his army post. But there was just no spark there. I needed somebody who would challenge me. And you know, Daddy, Daddy always called him that Yankee boy. He said, Lottie, you can marry that Yankee boy any day of the week. But James Clark is too smart for you. Now, James Clark was a young lawyer in Hamilton. James Clark is who caught my eye. And when Daddy said that, did I hear a challenge? Yeah, I think I did. Within six months, James and I were engaged. So the wedding was going to be at our home again. And we were upstairs in separate rooms. And when the appointed time came, we opened our doors, and we were getting ready to walk down to our guests. And James pulled me close to whisper what I thought would be a sweet nothing in my ear. But when it was, I felt the cold barrel of a pistol against my ribs, he whispered, there will be a wedding here today, or a funeral here tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, to say the least, I became Mrs. James Clark that day. He had heard about my escapade with Ambrose, and he wasn't going to take any chances. I think I met my match in that man, for surely James Clark was one of a kind. Now, we settled in his hometowns of Jones Station, so I moved away from Oxford. Jones Station was a little bit out from Hamilton. He practiced law in Hamilton, of course, and he was respected by both political parties. He was known for his views, very outspoken gentleman. I was very well versed in, uh, in politics as well. And we had a, a nice home life. We had two sons. Our oldest son, Franklin, was born shortly after we got married. And I had a second son by the name of Peter. Unfortunately, Peter was a, not a strong child and did not live very long. So we were not blessed with other children. So Franklin became the apple of my eye. A little bit more of a mama's boy, perhaps. I don't know. I spoiled him. But I had my clubs and my associations that I went to, and I loved to garden. In fact, I grew dahlia flowers, and in 1859, I won the blue ribbon at the Butler County Fair for the best dahlia flowers. I also got 50 cents for that. <laughs> and it was also in 1859, however, that my papa passed away. Now, mama was not happy in Oxford by herself. Jenny was going to the college up there. She was 16 at the time. And she was the only one that was actually unmarried and left at home. And so Mama decided that she wanted to go back to Memphis, Tennessee. She wanted to move back there and be near family. So that is what she did. However, Jenny didn't like staying up at school by herself. She was very outspoken. And in 1859, 1860 is when the rumblings of war had started. And because we were a Virginia family, it seems like she was called names by her classmates as successionists or success. Well, Jenny didn't like being in school, so she wanted to go home, but they would not let her leave. So my ingenuitive, spirited little sister took it upon herself to get expelled. She always carried a pistol, you see. Jenny liked to shoot, too. And what she did one evening was she took that pencil, pistol and she shot out every single star in the flag that flew over the college. Then she took a diamond ring and etched into the glass 
Hooray for Jeff Davis. <gasps> to say the least, she was expelled. <laughs> she came to stay with us at Jones Station for a short time before she moved on down to Tennessee to be with Mama. And of course, when the war started, they did their part for the Confederacy. Now, most of my family was in the Confederacy. Some of you, you may have heard of. I had a cousin by the name of Lottie Moon as well. Although she was not part of the war, we were both named after my grandmother, Charlotte. Whereas I'm Cynthia Charlotte, she is Charlotte Diggs Moon. People confuse us sometimes, but we're nothing alike. No, she became a Baptist missionary and moved to China, something I would never do. <laughs> so I also have a cousin by the name of Ona. Ona Moon became a doctor. She was a Confederate war doctor. And I also have her brother, Jacob, rode with Mosby's Marauders. He was known as Daredevil Moon for some of his daring deeds that he did through the war. But it was during the war that our home in Jones Station kind of became a stopping point for people with Southern sympathies. We uh, were always known for our views. I guess you could call us Peace Democrats or Copperheads. And of course, unionists didn't like that. We were friends with Walker Taylor. Now, Walker Taylor was Zachary Taylor's nephew. He was very much a Confederate sympathizer, so to speak, but he stopped at our home quite often in his journey. And one time, he was, happened to be there, and because he was so well known, there was some dispatches that needed to go to General Kirby Smith in Kentucky. And Walker was afraid that if he took them, he would be caught. So I saw another challenge there. I dressed myself up as an Irish washerwoman, took a boat down to Lexington and delivered the messages myself. I came back on a train but I had heard in the train station they were talking about a female spy. So I played my part well. I sat behind a Union general and his wife, and I made sure they knew I was very upset. So when they finally turned around to ask me what was wrong, I said, I'm afraid I've been down visiting someone in the hospital, and I'm thinking they're going to think I'm the Confederate spy. They believe me. I guess I was a better actress than I knew I was. So they helped me off the train when it stopped off the back. I walked home from there, and from that point on, I was pretty much in the business. Now, I guess my exploits were made known in Canada, where we had a group of Confederate sympathizers and they invited me up there. And that is where I obtained some forged papers to show that I was an English citizen by the name of Lady Hull. So I assumed that persona most of the time. And I don't know if Lady Hull was more of a favorite, but I always chose somebody with a little bit of an accent to hide my own. Even though I was raised in Ohio, I think I always had a soft Southern accent from the family. Now, as Lady Hull, I journeyed to Washington, D.C., and I was going to take some dispatches down to Virginia. And while I was in Washington, D.C., I mixed around with some of the socialites there, got to know a few things, picked up a few things here and there. But I was introduced to a gentleman by the name of Edwin Stanton. And as you know, he was the Secretary of War at the time. And I told him that I arrived in this country and that I needed to take the warm waters of Virginia and Arkansas for my rheumatism 
only to find out there was a war going on. So I think he, he took some sympathy on me and offered to escort me to the front lines. He was going down to view the troops, you see, in McClellan's camp. But when I arrived to get in the coach, we had another uh, traveler with us, a very tall gentleman with a, a beard and a stovetop hat. Yes, Abraham Lincoln was our travel mate. So I found myself in a carriage with the Secretary of War and the President of the Union. I never expected that. So since they were just talking niceties while I was awake, I pretended to be asleep. And then they kind of opened up and was talking about different things and strategies. I picked up quite a lot on that journey. And when we got to McClellan's camp, and I was a guest of the president, of course, I was given a pass to go straight through the lines. Although, while I was down there, it became known that I was the passenger, and Edwin Stanton didn't like that. He put a $10,000 reward on my head, dead or alive. So I stayed with family for a while in Virginia, and during that time, my mother and my sister, Jenny, Jenny, you see, I guess she wanted to be a little bit more like her older sister. She decided that she was going to start carrying messages back and forth. And sometimes she would walk straight through the picket line. And she would tell the soldiers guarding there that she was just secretly going to meet a bow. And they would always let her go through. You see, Jenny was quite a looker and a big flirt. So it was during that time that she and Mama came up to visit my son and husband at Jones Station, and she carried dispatches, but also when they would go back, they would take opium and cocaine and morphine and bandages and different supplies that was needed in the South. And this particular time, there had been a young man coming around the house. This young man was introduced to my husband of a, a gentleman of good family, meaning that he had the same sympathies that we did. Unbeknownst to my husband, though, he was more of a union spy. He was supposed to report back to his commanding officers what was going on in our house, because our house had become under suspicion. So while Mama and my sister were visiting, he would come often. There wasn't much to report other than that Walker Taylor was a regular visitor. And so when it was known that Mama and Jenny was going to go back to Tennessee, they were going to be traveling on the Alice Dean steamship. So this gentleman, reported to his uh, port authorities that there was two spies getting on the ship. And of course, they got on. My husband took them down, made sure the luggage was on. And when they were in their stateroom, a captain came and he said he had orders to search their stateroom. Well, Jenny had some dispatches tucked in her bodice. And of course, she had letters and different things and supplies in her trunk. And she did not want to be caught with the dispatches. Now, the dispatches were the most important thing. So she made a fuss, and she pulled out her little revolver that she always kept in her hidden pocket. And she leveled it at him, and she said, Do you want to search me? I don't think I could bear it. And I bet you your commanding officer, General Burnside, does not know about this. He is a family friend of mine since I was five years old, and you better check out your orders. So when this captain left to check his orders, she took the dispatches out of her bodice, wet them in some water, and swallowed them. So when they did come back, she was tying on her bonnet, and she and Mama went along with them. 
Now, when they were taken first, they were taken to a gentleman, Captain Kemper. Now, Captain Kemper went to Miami University. He was also a friend of the family and had called upon and courted my sister Molly. So you see, we had intermixing friends all through both sides. So when she was brought in front of Captain Kemper, she told him, I don't know, I was just taking some of this stuff back. And when he asked her why she had so much opium, she said, Mama requires that. She can eat that in a month. Poor Mama had to sit there straight-faced and not give Jenny away. Of course, Captain Kemper knew that couldn't be the reason. But his report stated that there was no reason for these ladies not to be charged with spying. So they were supposed to have an interview with the commanding officer in Cincinnati, which at that time was my old beau, Ambrose Burnside. So when they were brought in front of Ambrose, he asked her, my dear, why in the world did you try to go across the river without permission from me? So she said he was very sympathetic and that he told them that he would keep them under his protection in the Burnett house. Well, myself, in the meantime, <clears throat> I was making my way up from Virginia where I had an extended stay. Remember the little incident? Yeah, well, I was coming up and I had heard along the way that Mama and Jenny had been detained at the Burnett house. I had not heard that Ambrose was the commanding officer. So dressed as Lady Hull, I presented myself at the Burnett house and my story was that I was from England and that I was coming to take the waters of America when I found out there was a war and I found out that there were spies in this hotel and I was wondering what they were going to do with them. I was brought in front of the commanding officer and this was the story I told and of course I recognized him and was hoping that he did not recognize me. It has been almost 20 years. However, after I told my nice long story, he said, Madam, you may not remember me, <laughs> but I cannot forget the many pleasant hours we spent in Oxford, Ohio. Ambrose was a true friend. He took us all under his protection. He made sure that our trial was by him and his immediate officers, and that no newspaper articles would be printed saying we were caught. There was one that slipped through before he was able to catch it, and it was just talking about two spies caught, which was Mama and Jenny. So Ambrose, I suppose I was secretly flattered that he remembered me so fondly. But as time came, we were detained for quite a few weeks. And then, of course, we were supposed to not do any other espionage. I pretty much retired a little bit. My husband decided he was going to retire his business as a lawyer. And Jenny, of course, continued her escapades until the end of the war. And she was never caught again. That was good, because Ambrose might not have been there. But as the war ended, my husband and I sold all of our property, and we moved to New York City. It was there in New York City that he took up a private practice for a little while. And I became a reporter for a New York paper under the pseudonym of Charles M. Clay. It was a political paper, and they thought that maybe they would not listen to the views of a woman. So Charles being the male version of Charlotte, that's what I became. So under Charles M. Clay, I wrote many articles. And when the Franco-Prussian War broke out, I was sent overseas as a war correspondent. So I was in France 
with Napoleon III and his wife Eugenie. And there was another gentleman there. After the war, he traveled to Europe and he was asked to be the liaison between the French and the German. Do you know his sideburns were named after him? Ambrose was there. He was highly respected by both sides and he tried very hard to travel between the two under a flag of peace and, and bring peace there. But of course it didn't work. But it was nice to see him again. When France was invaded though, Napoleon's wife, Eugenie, had to be evacuated with a lot of the others, and I was in that group. And we were evacuated to London, to England. And it was there that I met a lot of literary folks and was in those circles. And that is where I got another challenge, another challenge by Lord Linton, and he said, why don't you write a novel where the heroine, or the hero, or whatever, is a woman, the main character. So I took up that challenge, and I have written three novels already, several poems and other things. And since I am a recent widow, I had traveled around all the way from the East Coast of Chicago giving lectures about France and England, politics and different things such as that. But I've decided that I'm going to settle down and retire a little bit. I'm going to move to Philadelphia where my son is an Episcopal minister and live with him and his family. Now I know French so well that they've, I've been offered a job to translate French novels into English. So I know it's not a very, very exciting retirement, but I always have my memories to fall back on. So I hope you understand a little bit more about how I became a spy and because I still don't know, but I know it's that spark and that adrenaline rush that always kept me going. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lottie. And You're George. welcome. <laughs> Do any of you have any questions? Yes. I'm, I'm assuming Mr. Clark knew of your adventures. Oh, he was very supportive. Okay. Yes. Yes. He, uh, he was more or less, he thought I was the damnedest, smartest woman he ever met. <laughs> that was his comment especially after he and my son, or Franklin, stayed up the whole night before her first book went to the publisher and they read it. That was his comment that he made afterwards. Um, she wrote um, three of them, and I've never read them. They were first published under Charles M. Clay, though. But now Modern Publications has it as Charlotte Moon. But um, Jenny, just to kind of fill in everything, Charlotte died when she was 67 years old. She died um, in Philadelphia with her son's family. And her sister Jenny lived to be 81. She lived until 1925. Now Jenny never married. She ran a boarding house for gentlemen only in the South for a while. And when she got bored with that, she went to Hollywood. In 1919, she was in two silent films with Douglas Fairbanks Jr. And so when the director asked her, what makes you think you can act? And she said, I'm 75 years old. I've acted every part. <laughs> so if you ever want to see Robin Hood with Douglas Fairbanks Jr., she's the old crone. 
She was not billed as Virginia Moon, though. So she ended up her life in New York in Greenrich Village. Greenrich, is that? Greenwich. Greenwich. Greenwich Village, telling stories and writing her memoirs. And um, it seemed like Ambrose and Lottie's husband both died the same year. So no matter which one she married, she'd have been a widow at the same time. <laughs> I saw a hand over here. He married. Um, they never had any children, though. But yeah, he did marry. So his broken heart wasn't total. Yeah. Um, where were the two sisters and mother kept when they were in Cincinnati? In the Burnett house. When they were still in the Burnett house. Mm -hmm. um, and was there a verdict in that case? I have not read any that I found, but since they were released after three, I think it was three months, I doubt. He just kind of waited till all the fervor died down, and then he let him go. <laughs> Anyone else? An interesting fact about uh, Burnsides, I came across, oh, a year or so ago, that Ambrose Burnside, who grew up in, is it New Liberty, Indiana? In Liberty, Indiana. Yeah, Liberty, Indiana, which is mm -hmm. about 50 miles from here, I think. Mm -hmm. He was an apprentice tailor here in Lebanon well, for about six months or so. Uh, he worked at uh, 2 South Broadway, where Anna's Gourmet Popcorn is now. And so his, uh, it was a lawyer's office above him, and Robert C. Corwin, the, the, the son of Ichabod Corwin, the, the, one of the founders of Lebanon, and the cousin of Governor Tom Corwin, uh, worked in the office above, and the two of them met at one time and reminisced about, uh, about Lebanon. But uh, Burnsides did live here in Lebanon for less than a year or so. Yes. Um, did Lottie or Carrie share their um, father's abhorrence of slavery, or do you think their activism on behalf of the Confederacy was just because of their heritage? Well, they truly believed that given time, that slavery would die out on its own. They didn't believe that war was the solution. And that was the view of the Copperheads or Peace Democrats. <coughs> that was their common belief, that slavery just needed to die out on its own without violence. And that's why they were called Peace Democrats, I think. So they just figured that it would uh, just not become useful, especially with some of the industrialization that was beginning in our country. But I do know that some of the people that were up here believed that if all the slaves were freed at once, that it would cause an economic collapse and that they may come up here and take away jobs from some of the, like the Irish and the and those people. So there was a lot of different reasons. You know, the Civil War was not totally about slavery, the way some people think. States' rights, they believed in states' rights too, to do what they wanted. A lot of part of that was slavery, the right to have slavery. True, true. Well, thank you very much, Lottie, and thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Uh, folks, I want to remind you that the uh, Baby, it's cold outside, the new display on the main floor of the Harmon Museum. Press one on the elevator, I think you'll love it. Please also remember, if you're coming to next month's Lunch and Learn, which is War uh, Abraham Lincoln's many Warren County connections, and I'll be your speaker, please make your reservation one week ahead of time, the Wednesday before the talk, okay? Uh, well, thank you very much, and see you next time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.